Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I think I say something pretty similar every time this text comes around uh, about the story of Thomas and, and his encounter with Jesus after the resurrection. Every year I try to explain that Thomas has a, a bad rap. This Sunday is known as Doubting Thomas Sunday. Yes, Thomas wanted to see the wounds in Jesus' hand and his side to really believe that Jesus has been risen from the dead. But that's true with every disciple when they first heard that Jesus was alive. They all doubted at first, which tells me that it's okay to doubt, that there's room in the church for doubt. This past week at Men's Group, we talked about doubts and questions when it came to our faith, and one of the interesting topics that we touched on was the tone of Jesus when he spoke to Thomas. Was he angry and disappointed, or was he loving and kind? We concluded that Jesus was loving and kind throughout his entire ministry, so that was probably the case when he was talking with Thomas about his doubts. I think if we identify with Thomas because if we're truly honest, we all have doubts. <clears throat> Maybe not all the time, but there are seasons in our life when everything just becomes too much. We begin to question and we begin to doubt. I recently read a section from St. Augustine's book, Confessions. He writes, My heart was utterly darkened. Wherever I looked was death. Tears were sweet to me. Could my heart fly from my heart? Could I fly from my own self? We all have some sense of doubt in our lives. So when the disciples huddled together in that upper room after Jesus died, they were lost. Their teacher, their master, their friend is gone. They were scared, and wherever they looked, they saw the end. But Jesus came into that darkness. He came back into the light to show them, to show us that we don't have to turn and run away. That Jesus continues to fulfill his promise to always be with us. All that Thomas wanted was, was proof that this was real, that everything Jesus told them before he died was true. And there's other passages in the Bible that show us that Thomas wasn't necessarily one to run away from, from danger or hurt. In John chapter 11, we read that Jesus' friend Lazarus was gravely ill. Jesus wanted to be with his friend, but he knew that there was danger all around him. And all the disciples, except Thomas, begged Jesus not to go to see his friend. But Thomas said, let us all go, so that we may die with him. There could never be any doubt that Thomas loved Jesus, that he loved him enough that he was willing to die with him. Thomas knew that something was going to happen to Jesus. He knew that he was willing to be by Jesus' side when this happened. But when Jesus died, Thomas was so brokenhearted that he went off to be by himself in grief. And this happens, right? How many times when we experience grief or loss or disappointment in our life that we want to be alone? We want to separate ourselves from the people that we love to work through our own feelings. We don't want to be around our family or our friends. It becomes difficult to go anywhere, even to church, where we feel closest to God. We know what it feels like to hurt, to feel the depths of sorrow. But I believe we also know what it feels like to come together as a community to support each other in our time of sorrow or grief. There is healing in the communion of tears. And in those gatherings, when we come together, we feel the risen Christ among us. 
We find that ultimately we are strengthened by the struggles and the anguish that we experience because of the community gathered with one another, for one another. So when we find ourselves getting up in the middle of the night filled with fear, filled with anxiety, not knowing where to go or who to turn to or what to say or, or even how we got this way, all, when, when all we see before us is the deepest, darkest, most dreadful kind of doubt that we can imagine, well, my friends, we can think back to Thomas and remember what he needed most was not to be alone, was not to run away, but to push through and be surrounded by his friends, by his loving community. And, and what he sees before him in this community is Jesus who comes and says, I love you, Thomas. Don't doubt, but believe. I am here for you. I will care for you because that's what I promised to do. Because in doubt comes faith. Now this may seem counterintuitive at first, but through doubt comes our faith. I, I think this is true, and, and I read from author Scott Peck. He wrote in his book, The Road Less Traveled, the path to holiness lies through questioning everything. Let me say that again. The path to holiness lies through questioning everything. Thomas doubted that Jesus was alive, and he turns to his, to his friends and says, I don't believe what you are saying. And then Jesus is standing right in front of them, and Jesus says, put your finger here in my hands. Put your hand in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Now, if we don't have any doubts at all about anything, then we're probably not taking what we experience seriously enough. I mean, think about it. When we come and when we confess our faith, we, we confess that the creator of the universe not only knows we exist, but cares so deeply, so passionately about our ups and downs, our hopes and dreams, that God wants to be with us and that God knows our name. That God knows every hair on our head. And God knows us and loves us even if we don't have any hair. <laughs> now think about it. We, we, who are we to deserve so much attention, so much love and grace from God? Who are we to have the promise that God is with us and that God loves us no matter what? And that God's love can never be taken away from us. Think about how amazing that is. So when we come here on a Sunday and we hear the Word of God, when we experience the sacraments together, when we join with one another, and, and Christians throughout the world to sing together, to pray together, to support one another in our doubts and fears together, when we do this, we are inviting God into our very midst. And God promises to be there. Now for some, it's, it, it's really easy. For others, it's a little more difficult. But Thomas comes to faith because he first is able to voice his doubts, to voice his questions, and then he experiences Jesus himself. We do that too. We have our doubts, we have our questions, we have our fears, and we have opportunities to talk with one another, to, to pray with one another, to express those questions with one another, to learn about the risen Christ together. Now during the next few Sundays, uh, during the Easter season, we will be exploring together the resurrection stories. So what happens when Jesus, when he is risen from the dead? Where does he go? Who does he talk to? And what are the reactions of the disciples when they are with him? Because when we hear these stories, when we experience them together, we can then bring them back into our own lives and say, how do I experience this? How do I experience this news that is so great 
to, to be true, that it may be unbelievable at first. We'll hear about Jesus having breakfast with his disciples. We will relive the conversation that Jesus has with Peter and how he forgives Peter for denying him. We will read together the story of the disciples who meet Jesus on the road to Emmaus. And we will, we will listen and, and experience the commission that Jesus gives to his disciples and to us. Because the resurrection doesn't end with doubting Thomas. It doesn't end with the disciples in a, a locked room behind closed doors. I'm sure it would have been easy for the disciples to stay there, just to be there with each other and support each other. I think if it was up to us, we would stay behind closed, locked doors as well, where it's safe. But God invites us, and God tells us to go out into the world to take risks, to put ourselves out there and let the world know about God's amazing love. To let the world know that it's okay if you have doubts, Come anyway. It's okay if you have questions. Ask. It's okay if you don't have your life together the way that you want, because nobody does. Come anyway. When we come into the sacred space, we invite the Holy Spirit into our lives, the same Holy Spirit that was with the disciples, working through their doubts and fears. The same Holy Spirit that comes into our lives and lets us know that it is all true, that Christ is risen. So that like Thomas, we can look at the cross and we can come to the font. We can kneel at the altar and we can experience the goodness, uh, the greatness and the love of God. And when we come to the altar to receive communion, the body and blood of Christ, we can leave and, and say with confidence, my Lord and my God. We do this because we know that God is working through our baptism. God knows us by name. The God of the universe knows each and every one of us. And we are reminded when we come into this space that we are marked with the cross of Christ forever. And there are going to be times in our life when we do struggle when we, like Thomas, want to turn and run because of the grief in our life, to separate ourselves when life becomes too tough. But my hope and prayer is, as fast as we run away, we will run even faster back to the cross, to our faith community. And we can experience again the amazing power of, of word, water, witness, and wholeness found in worship with the people of faith and the power of God. Amen.